all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I think that's the first, one of the first verses that I learned when I was a young boy uh, going to Bible class. I can still see our Bible class teacher teaching us that verse and then the times we practiced and remembered uh, committed that verse to memory. We'll use that a little bit later in the lesson as a kind of a jumping off point. I really didn't plan on being here this morning at, uh, or right here. <laughs> I planned on being here at worship but not here in Tyler's spot this morning. But uh, we do hope that he's feeling better very soon. They always say you have to have an attention step, and I'm not sure what, what I was going to say, so I'll just say it. How about those Buckeyes? <laughs> come on. I mean, come on. How about those Buckeyes, right? Three seconds to go, and they pulled it out. I know I don't, if Sean's up in the room, I don't know if he's up there, but that's my attention step. Um, I moved here in September of uh, 1987, so it's been a little while, but I think this is the absolute hottest and dry summer that I've lived through uh, in Houston, Texas. I mean, it was crazy hot, not like the Astros, but uh, it was hot, and it's been hot. I feel like uh, a lot of times it's like Frosty the Snowman when he got shut in that greenhouse, you know, just a puddle of water. I mean, it's, it's been hot. And this time of year, you know, you, there's, there's two really important pieces of equipment that you get to know, right? The thermometer and the thermostat. Thermometer, you know how that is, it's a pretty simple instrument. Uh, it just rises and falls with the temperature or whatever room or wherever it's at. Uh, it's a passive instrument. It doesn't do anything to affect the surroundings. It's just a reflection of the surroundings. But a thermostat, that's a little more complex, right? Like over here on the walls. Right, the thermostat is that complex instrument that you set it on the perfect setting, and then that thermostat, uh, when it senses a deviation from that perfect temperature, well, it goes into action, right, and, and to, to influence the surroundings and try and bring that room uh, back to that perfect setting. It either turns the AC on, which is about 11 months out of the year here, or maybe the heater. But uh, two important pieces of equipment, thermometers and thermostats. But, you know, Christians can be characterized by either one of those two things. We're either like thermometers. I hope I don't get this trans transcribe my words, but we're either like thermometers where we're just a reflection of our surroundings or we're like thermostats that are trying to influence our surroundings. And that's what I want us to talk about today. Which one are we? Are we like a thermometer or are we like a thermostat? Paul told the, the, the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, he said, Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? And that's what I want us to do this morning is examine ourselves and see which one of those two things best characterizes me as a Christian. Some Christians are like thermometers. In the physical realm, uh, we're just a reflection of our surroundings. I want us to, before we, before we examine that a little bit deeper, I want you to think about what a Christian really is. In Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 3, the scripture says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death is no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Brethren, when we were baptized into Christ, our old man of self, our old man of sin is, is put to death, is crucified, if you will. 
That old man of sin is buried in the waters of baptism, but we don't stay there, right? We're raised up out of the waters of baptism. Our sins have been washed away. We're cleansed, and now we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Those old things are gone, and, and we're new. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 17, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And that's why Paul said in Galatians 2, uh, 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul says that he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 that you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. But you know, some Christians, they just don't pay attention to that. Some Christians are just like a thermometer, just a reflection of the world around us. We've forgotten that we've been transferred from that dark world of darkness and into the light. But some Christians, we just forget that, and we're just like the world. People can't really tell the difference between us and the world. And you can see it in our attitudes toward morality, toward speech, toward how we dress, our ethics. You know, all those sorts of things, we're not a lot different than the world. Our attitudes toward morality, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, all those deeds of the flesh, uh, sometimes... Christians, you can't even tell the difference from the world because we either actively approve of those things or passively we just don't say anything. They just don't bother us. But the scripture tells us in Romans chapter 12, uh, 13, rather, in verses 12 through 14, the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the, for the flesh in regard to its lusts. We read in uh, Romans chapter 6, in verse 12, he goes on to say, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting your members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as instruments, uh, as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in, in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. We have to ask ourselves when we're going through our daily lives, when we, when we, uh, you know, are, am I like a thermometer? Am I just a reflection of the world around me? Or do people see a difference you know, that I don't approve of these, these, uh, imm the immorality and, and those sorts of things? That I care whether people make the right choices. And am I, am I sharing that with others? Am I sharing that faith with others? You know, uh, I'm amazed how people dress nowadays. And I go out, you know, when I'm traveling out on the road, it, it amazes me. Just the, the attitudes of how people present themselves when they go out in the world. I, I tell my wife a lot of times, I'm convinced that there's a, a mirror shortage uh, in our country. Because there's no way somebody could look at themselves in the mirror and say, man, that's great. I look great. I'm, I'm going to go out like that. But they do. You know, there's very little dignity in the way people dress nowadays, a lot of times. There are body parts that are, that are shown that have no place being shown in public. But people don't have a problem with that. And you know, I, I'm reminded uh, of a couple places in the book of Jeremiah when he was preaching to, to Israel and to Judah about, about their iniquity. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 15, he says, Were they ashamed because of the abomination they've done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. There are a lot of people today, they don't even know how to blush. 
In Jeremiah chapter 3, he says that they, were, they refused to be ashamed. But brethren, how, how are we dressing as Christians? Do we dress the same way that the world does? What about our speech? Do we speak like the world? Can, can the world tell a difference by how we talk? Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good uh, for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. How do we speak? Do we curse? Do we swear? Those are, that's a bad habit. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, I flew in a fly, fighter squadron for 10 years, and there's some pretty salty language. And it's been a long time, but, but I fell into that trap. And that's a hard habit to break. But how do we speak? How, what does the world hear when, when they hear us speak? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4 says, There must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of saints. What kind of jokes do we tell? What kind of stories do we tell? What kind of memes do we share? You know, all those sorts of things. Does it reflect that I'm a Christian or does it reflect that I'm just part of the world? We could go on a, a, about uh, all these different things, but I think there's two reasons for this kind of behavior, why, why Christians are, are like thermometers a lot of times. Because one, they just don't have a desire to leave the world. You know, I'm comfortable in the world. Uh, you know, I know I'm a Christian. I know I'm supposed to be different, but, you know, it's just easier to just go along. We kind of try to ride both sides of the fence. But we can't do that. Jesus said no one can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one or love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus said you've got to choose a side. It's either me or the world. James says in James chapter 4 and verse 4, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Sometimes people just don't want to give those things up. Sometimes people are like a thermometer because they don't want to stand out from the crowd. You know, I just kind of want to hide my Christianity so nobody bothers me. Uh, you know, I don't want to be made fun of. The, I don't want to be persecuted. But Jesus said again, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, If anyone suffers as a Christian... He's not to be ashamed, but it's to glorify God in that name. If being different causes us to be persecuted, so be it. But we've got to determine not to be like a thermometer. You know, in the spiritual realm, a lot of Christians are like thermometers as well. We're just going along with the times. We've abandoned the convictions and those fundamental bedrock truths of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 4 through 6, those seven ones. We've abandoned those to, to kind of acquiesce to the whims of the world. But Paul warned us, he said in Ephesians 4 and verse 14, he said, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and craftiness in deceitful scheming. No, we've got to hold on to the fundamental truths, those seven ones. There's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Those have to be the bedrock things that we hold on to. Christians today sometimes question or wonder, well, who's really a Christian? You know, we don't want to, again, base our faith on the fundamental truths of God's word, but we, you know, we kind of want to act, I don't want to judge people, I don't want to be unkind, I don't want to, and so... You know, there may be some people that have a differing view of what it takes to be a Christian, but I'm not going to be the one to tell them. There are some people that, uh, Christians, well, is baptism really necessary? Do I need to be baptized in order to be, have my sins washed away? We question that. Some do. Well, they make up the Lord's church. How many churches are there? What constitutes proper worship? 
You know, the worship that's laid out in the scripture is pretty basic. Sing, pray, commune, give. We have teaching, preaching, public reading of, of God's word. That's pretty simple. But a lot of times churches today have decided, well, we need to spice things up a little bit. You know, that, that old way is boring. And so we've got to inject some of our own wants and wishes and spice it up a little bit because that, that's what's going to attract people. And we forget it's not what we want that attracts people. Listen, if people love God and are sincere about serving God according to His ways, that's what's going to draw them. You know, a lot of Christians are like thermometers. They just kind of base their beliefs on, you know, shift things around and what was popular at the time. One of the reasons for that, I think, is ignorance of God's Word. We really just don't know what God teaches. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, the scripture says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Since you've forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. Sometimes Christians are just too lazy to get into the Word and study it and to, to understand what it says, and then to, to hold fast to it. We've been warned that people are going to come and twist the scriptures. You know, that's not a secret. The scripture says, Paul warned the Ephesians, uh, the elders at Ephesus in Acts 20 and verses 29 and 30, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, from among your own selves. Men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the Spirit explicitly says in latter times that some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons uh, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Again, in 2 Peter chapter one, uh, 2 and verses 1, 2, and 3, Peter says, False prophets arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. Folks, we've got to know God's word. We've got to base our faith on God's word and be able to refute when, when people come in and teach these strange and varied doctrines. There's a couple motivations for this as well. One is just selfishness. You know, I want to do things my way. I want to worship God how I like to. I want to, you know, teach what I want to teach. But that, you know, we can't do that. That doesn't have a place in God's, in God's kingdom. Isaiah said in Isaiah 55 and verse 9, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You know, it's not just that God's way is better. God's way is the only way if we're going to be pleasing to Him. When it comes to spiritual matters, it's got to be done God's way and not ours. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves on the outside. There is this thing called presumption, the sin of presumption, where we, we take liberties where we don't have the authority to. We want to change up the roles of men and women in the church. We want to change how we worship. We want to change God's plan of salvation because that's just what pop, what's popular at the time. But we don't have the authority to do that, and that is called the sin of presumption. Some people make this mistake, if you will, uh, because they have a misunderstanding of love and unity. You know, we want to love everybody, and so we don't want to, to point out error. You know, it, it might be hurtful if I say that, that these people are Christians according to God's word, and if you haven't done these things, then you're on the outside. Well, that, that's not love. But that's a misunderstanding of what God's love is. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so again, we have to know what the will of God is. And we have to hold fast to that. Sometimes it's hard to, to take a stand like that, right? It's hard to tell people God's truth. Because it might step on their toes. It might, it might cause some angst. But think about what Paul told the Galatians in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? If we love people, if we love their souls, we're going to teach them the truth or at least tell them the truth uh, you know, as best we can according to God's word. We've got to do it in love. We have to do it in kindness. But we can't shy away from telling people God's plain basic truths. 
sometimes people want to have unity, and so we don't want to, you know, stir the pot, if you will. Unity, though, is, is defined as the fact or condition of being one. In most contexts, it apply, implies a fundamental agreement of interdependent and usually varied components, which in turn produces harmony as a thought, purpose, etc. A un unity, that's unity. It's that, it's that we're all on the same page. Okay? But sometimes unity and union get kind of mixed up. Because union doesn't necessarily mean that we're all on the same page. Sometimes union is just joining together of two different bodies and then whatever results after that. And so you hear these terms sometimes Christians refer to other people as our Christian cousins, you know, or our distant relatives. But we forget that warning again that, that Paul gave to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. If anyone comes and preaches a different gospel than that which we preach, let him be accursed. And he was so emphatic about that, he said it again a second time. If, if you, anyone preaches a different gospel than that which you received, let him be accursed. It's a big deal to teach a different gospel than what we read in the scriptures. Okay? And we've got to know what those things are, what those truths are. Are you like a thermometer in your Christian life? If you are, you're in danger of losing your soul. I mean, that's the hard truth. You can't vacillate between the world and Jesus. You remember Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. He told Israel, how long are you going to vacillate between two opinions? If we're thermometers and in our Christian lives, He's asking us the same thing. How long are you going to vacillate between the world and God? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, He who is not with me is against me. We can't just be a mere reflection of our environment and be on the side of the Lord. No, we've got to be different. Tyler put a slide up, I think, last week uh, on holiness, you know, that, that where the, the one person was moved into the world or out of the world into the church and then they all ended up over in the world you couldn't really tell the difference you know that's a question you have to ask uh, ourselves can people see a difference in me or am I just like the world no we've got to be an active instrument of God we've got to make a transformation in ourselves out of darkness into the light and now become that, therm that thermostat that's going to make a change. Let's talk about thermostats real quick, and then the lesson will be yours. First of all, a thermostat, you know, uh, you've got to have the perfect setting. And unlike, you know, the, the room temperature, whatever, it's not a subjective thing. No, the perfect setting for the Christian is objective, and it's based on God's Word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Scripture says that all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished for every good work. The, the perfect setting for the Christian is God's Word. That's where it's found. So let me give you three things real quick about our perfect setting. First of all, our eyes have to be fixed on Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The first thing in that perfect setting is have our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's got to be our focal point. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, the scripture says that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things uh, like we are yet without sin. Jesus is the perfect example for us. And so he deserves our complete and undivided attention. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Be imitators of me just as I am of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that, again, he's got to be our focal point. You remember Peter when he was walking on the water? You know, he had his eyes fixed on Jesus, and as long as he was focused on the Lord, he was walking on the water. But as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he started seeing the waves and the wind and the darkness, he started to sink. 
No, the perfect setting begins with our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so the psalmist says in Psalm 25 and verse 15, My eyes are continually toward the Lord, for He will pluck my feet out of the net. Jesus Christ, He's the Lamb of God. He's the light of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the mediator between God and men. He's the only way to the Father. He's the ultimate judge of mankind. And so our eyes have to be fixed on Jesus. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 40, A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he's been fully trained, will be like his teacher. The question we have to ask ourselves, are we training ourselves to be like Jesus? Are we spending time in His Word to be like Him? Are we seeing how He lived and how He taught and the things that He said? And are we trying to make those things part of our lives? The second thing is, uh, when it comes to that perfect setting, our mind has to be set on things above. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, the Scripture says, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Again, you go back to Romans chapter 6, that old man of, of sin has been put to, wet, uh, to death, he's been buried, we're raised up, we're a new creature now, and so we have to change our mind, we have to change the way we think. And that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and perfect and acceptable. Christianity demands that we change the way we think. We can't think like we used to, those old ways of the flesh that we can read about in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. We know that those, you know, if we allow our minds to dwell on things of the world, that's what's going to lead us ultimately into temptation. And we know that temptation, when it's fully realized, it brings forth sin. When it's accomplished, it brings forth death. James chapter 4 and verse 4. It's no wonder that Christians are admonished to control how we think. Right? Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. That's where our mind has to be focused on. That's what, that's what we've got to set our minds on. The third thing is we have to have our hope fixed on God. That's where our hope has to be set on. It has to be fixed on God. In 1 Timothy rather, chapter 4, and verses 7 through 10, Paul says, Have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is uh, only a little proof, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who's the Savior of all men, especially of believers. You know, hope is, is that desire or a wish that's supported by some confidence of its fulfillment. It's, it's an expectation uh, or a trust that we can place our confidence in. And can, you, can there be a better place to rest our hope than in God? The Almighty God, our Creator, our Sustainer, He's the one that always keeps His Word. He always keeps His Word. In 1 Peter chapter th uh, 1 and verse 13, the Scripture says, Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, and fix your hope completely on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's our end game when Jesus Christ comes again to take those who are His home to heaven with Him. And that's where our hope has to be fixed. Okay? So that's, how, that's that perfect setting. Our eyes fixed on Jesus, our minds fixed on things above, and our hope fixed on God Almighty. Well, now that we have that perfect setting, hopefully we're implementing those things in our lives. Now how do we be like that thermostat and influence other people around us? That's what our task is. You know, our present world is full of sin and darkness. Uh, you know, every day you, you can watch the news or you see something, you hear something, you wonder how, how much deeper into darkness can our country, can our world descend? 
The scripture says in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, Woe to those who call good evil, evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Jeremiah 22 and verse 13 says, Woe to him who builds his house without righteousness. We know Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Folks, in a world that's, that's just rushing headlong into darkness and sin, we're the lights. That's what we started with, Matthew chapter 5 and verses 14 through 16. We're the light of the world and we've got to show it. People have to be able to see in me that I'm not like the world. And sometimes it takes a voice. Sometimes you've got to be vocal and say, I, I can't agree. I'm not going to go along with this, this evil or this unrighteousness because God cares. Because I'm a Christian. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. People have to see in us a difference. And so you have to ask yourselves again, am I a thermometer or am I like that thermostat? Am I, am I, have I got that perfect setting where people can see and hear a difference in me? You know, concerning spiritual matters with the church, it's the same thing. We've got to be that voice that says we're not going to give in, we're not going to give way on God's fundamental truths about the church, about who's a Christian, about our worship practices. Now we've got to stand firm on God's truths. Proverbs 23 and verse 23, buy the truth and do not sell it. There's nothing that's worth more than God's truth. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you've received, whether by word of mouth or letter from us. We've got to hang on to the pattern that God has given us. You know, there's no guarantee that people will change their ways, that even when we speak out and, and try to influence, in fact, Jesus promised that the majority of people are not going to listen to you. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, he said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. But you know, even though we know the majority of people aren't going to listen to us, we still have to keep preaching the word. We still have to be living our Christian lives in front of people so that they might ask, why are you different? Why don't you speak like that? Why don't you think like that? Why don't you do things this way? No, they've got to be able to see Jesus Christ in us. You know, Jeremiah was pretty exasperated. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 3 and 4. Jeremiah 25, verse 3, he says, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, these twenty-three years, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I've spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, again and again, but you've not listened or inclined your ear, saying, uh, Turn now everyone from its evil way and from the evil of your deeds. Ezekiel, at the very beginning of his ministry, God told Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 4, I'm sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord your God. As for them, whether they listen or not, for they're a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, neither fear them, nor their words, nor though thistles and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions, neither fear their words, nor be dismayed at their presence, for they're a rebellious house, but you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not. Folks, we've got to take a stand on God's word, whether people listen or not. But people have to know that there's been a Christian among them when we associate with people. The world needs to know that there has been a Christian among them. Have you passed the test? Which one are you? Which one better characterizes your Christian life? A thermometer, or you just like the world, where people can't really see a difference. If that's you, determine a day to make some changes, whatever that might be. But determine a day to be not like the world, but to be different.
Maybe you're like a thermostat. You've got that perfect setting, but you just haven't been speaking out like you should. You know, the apostles, they prayed several times. There are several instances in the New Testament. They're praying, God, give us courage to speak more boldly. And we need to be praying that same prayer. Give us courage to speak more boldly about the beauty of Christianity and the perfection of God's plan. In Acts chapter 26, verse 17, God gave this mission to Paul. He said, I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who've been sanctified by faith in me. Folks, we're charged with that same exact mission, to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to hopefully bring people out of darkness and into God's glorious light. And it doesn't matter how many people refuse to listen. You know, if only one soul is turned by your example, by your words, it's worth it. Which are you today? Are you a thermometer or a thermostat? If you need to make some changes, would you let us know? Let's stand in